Good morning. Welcome to the Harry Jackson Show. I'm your host, Harry Jackson, joined in the studio by Dr. David Parlett. And uh, we want to hear from you bright and early this Monday, Monday, as somebody's saying, can't trust that day. Uh, morning at Bishop Harry, hashtag the Harry Jackson Show, or you can reach us now at theharryjacksonshow.com. And there are a lot of great stories that are in uh, the news today. And uh, we believe, though, that we've got an amazing opportunity, first of all, to be thankful to God that we live in a wonderful, safe country, that the transfer of power is absolutely without bloodshed, that for the most part there is safety within our borders, and uh, that there is, in fact, for some people who are at the bottom end of the spectrum, uh, there are social services, uh, and we're debating on how big the safety net is uh, for people. But if you are living in India right now uh, and you are poor or you're in Nigeria, you would be in, as some people say, a world of hurt. But for all of these wonderful benefits, you got to pay your taxes. And today is tax day. And uh, there are a lot of great stories. The first major one, I don't know what you think about this, David Parlett. My tax accountant is a high school kid. It was written by Oliver St. John. And this is in USA Today on the money page. And the story shows that there are certain high school kids that have been trained to do taxes. And uh, then uh, they are actually going around and doing folks work for them. And um, one particular place is uh, uh, A.J. Moore Academy in Waco, Texas, um, which is rated by the IRS as uh, the number one student VITA program in the nation. And uh, over the last eight years, A.J. Moore Students have prepared, are you ready for this, more than 10,000 tax returns. And as a result, people have received more than $15.4 million with an M refunds. And the students do such a good job that some folks come from more than 100 miles away to have their taxes prepared. And uh, it's an amazing thing. So... Awesome. Kudos to those uh, young high schoolers uh, being aggressive and uh, understanding how to help us get our tax dollars back. Well, they were trained to do so. So, question, did you do your own taxes? Oh, no, I uh, can't even begin to put it all together. There are too many details. My, my wife, though, uh, knows how to do her taxes. That, that's good, but when we got together, we can't, can't, can't get it together without uh, some help. Well, for years, I used to use H&R Block, and I loved the part where it said, if you have any problems and they want to take you in, bring you in for an audit, they got to go talk to them. On one occasion, that did happen. They were asking all kind of questions. I just said, all right, here, Mr. H&R, I've been paying you maybe a little bit of a, uh expensive fee, so we let them do it. And that gave me peace of mind. Mm -hmm. uh, today we have another accountant doing all these great things, and uh, I think it's great. But regardless, taxes are spoken of in the Bible. And um, I considered bringing a message on Sunday about um, pay your taxes uh, and honor God. I thought that would probably not go over it that well. Uh, <laughs> I did, didn't didn't really feel led to bring that message, but I can understand why we don't want a mass riot here. <laughs> yeah, but the taxes are vital, and what I can understand is that why we have such a challenge with charity and tax use. Philosophically, really, I think what we deal with, liberal versus conservative, is that. 
conservatives, especially those of us who are evangelical Christians, we would want to use our own money to express our own sense of charity and to help the people we feel led to help and our churches, organizations, and missions organizations feel led to help and to be able to use the name of Jesus or our religious conviction as part of the process. And there are a lot of folks who just want to take the money because it's morally right in their mind, but they're not going to bring any kind of um, preaching, moral values along with that. In fact, if you use their money and you say anything about Jesus, they will slap your wrist. I was watching Governor Huckabee last night. I liked his approach where he would love to see America be taxed on their consumption as opposed to being penalized for being taxed on your income. So what does that mean, tax and consumption? Being taxed on everything that we consume. So those who are millionaires, they're going to consume more, so they get taxed more as opposed to us being penalized for our income. A new way of looking at taxes. Well, no, it's not that new. I ask you the question rhetorically. Mm. You're talking more about a VAT tax, a value-added tax. So you only pay tax, including the national in England, it would be like 17.5% or something like that for on your purchases. And therefore, if you buy a house or this or that or the other, I assume housings are in it. Um, the nice thing I like about buying goods in England is if you buy something and you're shipping it back, you get that 17.5% back from the tax. So I, I think we're speaking really more of a value-added tax which boils down another way of saying it, it is a consumption tax. And um, that's one way of looking at life. Uh, and let's talk about flat taxes. And so I think tax structure needs to be simplified. But state taxes versus national federal taxes, it's an interesting discussion I think we need to have overall I'm of the school that we're paying too many taxes and too many people who have wasteful mentalities are signing on to things that we maybe don't need. Let's shift gears. Tax day, let's say this. Get an extension or pay your taxes. I think that's the message for all of us. Number two, somebody wrote on a headline, Great Scott! Mm. And uh, they were referring to Australian Adam Scott. And uh, some say he silences doubters with his win at the Masters. And uh, I'm kind of a skeptic. I think that Tiger Woods is having his problems returning. But he is doing better. I doubt that this guy, Adam Scott, is another Tiger Woods, what to say you? Tiger started young, excelled for a long time, could, if he got himself in a distraction-free zone, probably recapture uh, the territory. Uh, his, he's the one people are coming to see, um, probably not Adam Scott. What do you say mm. about this victory as it relates to uh, to Tiger, Go. yeah, mm -hmm. I, I saw it. It was a great two-hole playoff at the very end, and uh, you had some of the world's best players there at the Masters. Uh, Adam Scott's been around for a while, and uh, he sank that 12-foot putt there on, on the 10th hole in that two-hole playoff. Awesome. It was uh, it, it was great. Tiger made his penalty uh, early on by having to replay a shot that he accidentally had a backspin and rolled into the water and he placed he misplaced the ball the second time and they penalized him two strokes which caused him to just miss being right there in contention at the very end uh he he was in it the whole way in other words he was robbed he was robbed <laughs> he was robbed he, <laughs> he made a major mistake by talking about it the judges said it was okay he talked about it on the news, and uh, they reviewed the play and penalized him two strokes. If he never said anything, he would have gone on probably to possibly win. 
Uh, so it was close. He was in contention all the way. Great, great golf. Great golf these last four days. And, yeah, it, are, is there somebody there? Well, it's amazing. They had a 14-year-old Chinese boy who played uh, an eighth grader who played as an amateur all four holes at, at a score of 300 and uh, amazing young child. So, uh, yeah, there, there's a future for golf. So the lesson is immoral people do best at golf. I is hope, that no I hope not. <laughs> wrong conclusion? Okay. Well, maybe we should say that the jury is still out, though, about how much we give credit, honor, and celebrity to people who have one gift, and at the end of the day, their talent extends to the borders of that game. And we're paying all these multi millions of dollars. And do they really add anything else back to the rest of the culture? Forgive me. Mm. That may be a little bit too philosophical on a Monday morning hmm. uh, on tax day. But I, I think we're going to revisit that, especially when these characters want to ask us all for forgiveness because again and again, because at the end of the day, they want endorsements. And endorsements are given out based on the character references of if Tiger says, use this kind of shoe, you're going to use this shoe, mm -hmm. et cetera. So we need to come back to third story. We only got a couple of minutes. For the gun lobby, there's a schism, some say. Washington Post, who is certainly anti-gun, says there's a group that endorses new compromise. And they claim that they've got all these adherents, and they're saying we don't believe that we um, should stop these universal uh, background checks, et cetera. What do you say? Do you think that this uh, group, uh, the Citizen Committee for the Right to Keep and Bear Arms, is this group being played up too much in this debate? Is there a debate? And on the front page of the New York Times, we have our NRA spokesperson right there basically saying he's holding to his guns. What a play on words. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's important that we have the right still in America to, to keep our arms, to bear arms. Uh, and there shouldn't be any real problem doing a background check if they find that we're criminals and they certainly need to. Uh, be able to uh, uh, to stop us from purchasing guns as they, they might find that out from time to time. Uh, but we still need to have that privilege. Well, I think the real story here is not a story of gun control, not a story of the need. It's a story of politics. Mm -hmm. President Obama, who I honor as the president of our country, has shown time and time again he tries to strong arm uh, different and work different political issues manipulatively instead of going to do right first, get a policy that's right, and then try to rally around right. So for all this hoopla and drama that he's caused around the gun issues and trying to make people feel like you're the cause of all the murder of all these innocent people uh, and that kind of thing, um, it's not working. And I think Lapeer would have caved in. Everybody would have gone in with universal um, background checks. <clears throat> but I think the NRA is concerned, <clears throat> excuse me, if there seems to be a little bit momentum on the side of the president, he'll shift the debate, and then he'll try to, instead of taking an inch, he'll try to take three miles. So, therefore, they're stopping at what I believe to be an unreasonable non-compromise because you're playing political games with what a, a person I'm going to call a gamer. Uh, and um, it's sad. I just see politics, politics written all over these things. Right after our break in just a moment, you're listening to Harry Jackson, by the way, on the Harry Jackson Show, and uh, David Parlett. Uh, coming to you from beautiful downtown Beltsville, <laughs> Maryland. 
suburban Washington, D.C. And uh, we're going to be talking about the immigration uh, debate. And we're going to be talking about the fact that Marco Rubio uh, mounted the stage on about seven different programs. And uh, is he taking a big risk in being so much out front on immigration? Stay tuned. We'll talk to you in just a moment. If you own a business, then you know the ability to take credit cards is necessary, especially if you use the internet as part of your storefront. The shocking thing is there are so many credit card processors who don't think twice about taking care of the processing for immoral or objectionable businesses. If they process for your business, that essentially yokes you with those other companies. But there is an alternative. Cornerstone Payment Solutions will not provide credit card processing for those immoral or offensive companies. In fact, they offer businesses like yours a specific processing program that will support AFA by giving an ongoing donation for as long as your credit card processing is done by Cornerstone Payment Systems. Basically, it's processing with a purpose. And all the details are available at 877-356-1208. That's 877-356-1208. Cornerstone Payment Systems is a registered ISO of Harris Bank, Buffalo Grove, Illinois, member FDIC. Curing Cerebral Palsy. This is a special commentary from the Susan B. Anthony List, named for the suffragette who was proudly pro-life. Is this another adult stem cell breakthrough? We hope so. The Detroit News recently reported that Michigan doctors are treating a second cerebral palsy patient with adult stem cells. The first patient was a three-year-old girl who was given adult stem cells from her own umbilical cord blood. Within weeks of the treatment, both her speech and physical function improved greatly. Now those doctors are treating an 11-year-old boy the same way. They extracted adult stem cells from his umbilical cord blood, which had been frozen for 11 years, and they hopefully await the results. This is Marjorie Dannenfelser, president of the Susan B. Anthony List, inviting you to join us in our battle for life. For more, go online to sba-list.org. This is the Garlow Perspective. Would you like deep-seated peace in your life? then I encourage you to go from peace with God, as important as that is, and to go to receiving the peace of God. That is the peace of God deposited internally within your spirit. And how do you do that? By saying, I want to know him. But if you say, I want to know him, you are asking for suffering because one cannot fully know God, fully know him, without having all the human props taken away from them. And it's in that moment you come to rely on God in such a way you experience His peace. I call it the knothole effect. It's when you get pulled through the knothole of life where all your human props are taken, you find out that God is all you have, and it's not trite to say He is all you need. Jim Garlow at GarlowPerspective.com. Welcome back to the Harry Jackson Show. I'm your host, Harry Jackson, joined in the studio by David Parlent. And uh, we have a guest that is going to join us here. And he is Roy Beck, president and CEO of Numbers USA. And uh, Numbers USA, for some of us, has a scary ring to it. And um, before we talk to Roy Beck, let me remind you that this is tax day, tax day, tax day, and uh, we need to pay our taxes. It's biblical, and tax day perks uh, are available. AMC theaters offer free popcorn from April 12th to April 15th. Maybe you go out and see the movie 42, which we heard on Friday is also uh, awesome. Arby's has tax day curly fry, a curly fry instead of a regular fry on tax day. I don't know why a curly fry, Dr. Parlett. And small potato cakes giveaway on April 15th only. Sonic, happy hour, all day tax day. We're advertising happy hour. Oh, 
These are non-alcoholic drinks, folks. <laughs> and the one-half drinks. Uh, slushies on April 15th. And chilies, free appetizer or dessert with the purchase of an adult entree from the 13th through the 20th. Happy Tax Day. Keep America moving. And uh, I love, I love the fact that we get to pay taxes in America. I just don't want to get carried away and pay too many. All right. Roy Beck, the president and CEO of this great organization, Numbers USA, and uh, this nonprofit organization of three dozen employees and contracted specialists is managed by a team of seven professionals with nearly a century of experience with immigration issues. And Roy, you are a veteran journalist, author of four public policy books, a national lecturer, and um, we want to hear what you have to say uh, today on immigration. Welcome to the Harry Jackson Show. How are you today, sir? Well, good morning. It is uh, a little bit of a frightening week, and not because this is tax day, but because the gang of (laughs) so-called gang of eight in the Senate uh, is expecting to bring out its immigration bill tomorrow. And as you mentioned, Senator Marco Rubio of Florida was on all of the talk shows, TV talk shows yesterday, uh, trying to pitch it. And, uh, you know, every— And you just— you disagree with him? Opposed, a person's supposed to uh, is, is uh, Armageddon, uh, if you listen to us, I know. But i got to say that if this bill passes, uh, many aspects of America that we have known uh, are gone. And many aspects of America that we don't like are going to get so much worse. And I, I, I'll but, tell you what the key point is. This bill mm-hmm. will add millions upon millions of new foreign workers into the occupations of Americans who already are highly unemployed and already have had depressed wages for over the last 30 years. Now, now let me stop you there. Let's be a little bit interactive. We're going to give you most of this segment to talk. So, we again, we just appreciate you being here. So you think that, A, that there is more than 11 million people that are going to be added into it? You think those numbers are understated, perhaps? Well, first of all, the amnesty that will give work permits— and uh, for, mm-hmm. forgiveness for, for having broken the immigration laws, uh, to uh, an estimated 11 million, it could be, I think it could be as high as 18 million, but if it's 11 million, that's plenty. But it's not just that. This bill is going to uh, increase legal immigration by at least right. another 50%. In other words, it's already a million a year. Already we give out lifetime work permits, green cards, to a million immigrants a year, and this is wow. going to, it looks like, move it up to about a million and a half. Uh, so that's in addition to the seven million um, that, that, that are the illegal immigrants that are going to get their, their uh, permanent green cards as well. So you believe that jobs are going to be downgraded, compromised in order to exploit this influx of all these workers? Yes, because... One thing that classical, most classical economists, there's always a few in the French, agree, mm-hmm. is the supply of law, the supply of, uh, excuse me, the law of supply and demand uh, right, is it's real. Day, it's real. Mm-hmm. And with labor, if you have a particular occupation or types of occupations in which you increase the supply of labor, the value of that labor will go down. And that's what's happened right. over the last 30 years especially people who are in, who work or less educated Americans. Those are Americans who don't have more than a high school degree. The kind of jobs that less American yeah. uh, educated Americans have have seen their real wages, that's the inflation adjustment rate, wages, drop by about 22% over the last 30 years. Now, that's happened for all kinds of reasons, but one of them is, is that we've quadrupled immigration from 250000 a year to a million a year. Last 20 years, it's been running over more a million a year. And this bill wow. will flood those legal labor markets with millions more less educated immigrants to compete with our less educated. And, you know, when you just think about you think about all the people in our communities 
that are, that don't have more than a high school degree because they don't have the family resources to go to college, or because they, frankly, just don't have that interest to go to college. They or they may not have been born with the intellectual properties to do college, or they may be disabled. And in many, think right. about the hundreds of thousands of people who come out of prison every year, and they need a stepping stone job uh, to get out to, 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 in order to break the cycle of, of crime and incarceration. We've so many Americans who have been pushed out of the job market already, and now this bill, this Marco Rubio Gang of Eight bill, uh, is, is destined to add millions more people to compete with our unemployed Americans. Well, we're not enforcing the laws as they stand, do you think, in some levels, I mean, President Obama had some raids and whatnot to heighten the sensitivity, in my opinion, of the immigrant community to the fact that changes needed to be made. It it manipulated, in a sense, uh, folk to vote for him, I thought. But isn't it better for um, business that the cost of uh, labor, unskilled labor, go down? <laughs> well, in many ways... Business is an amoral kind of institution. Not the people who are I mean, people who are businessmen are are moral creatures. Business is kind of uh, you know it's there to make a profit, and the way it works in our society is that if you can't make a profit, you don't stay in business. And if your if your competitor can make a bigger profit or drive down prices or whatever, and you can't, that can drive you out of business. If we have a le- level playing field mm-hmm. in which nobody is a- allowed to hire illegal foreign workers, and the market allows the uh, uh, wages to rise, businesses have to figure out ways to get more productivity out of each of their workers. And the way that's worked in this society for, for two centuries is that businesses work smarter, more, more capital investment, more innovation, uh, and more technology. In the end, you get more out of each worker. You you can afford to pay each worker more money. That's especially what happened in the 50s and 60s. But once we once we unleashed mass immigration again in the in the uh, late 60s, that really kicked in in 1980. Um, businesses haven't had to do it, and so no. The, the, okay, well, I believe I believe most businessmen want to be good community people. Want to be good good. Uh, employers and have have workers who live middle class lives. They can't do it though if their competitors are allowed to hire illegal workers. I got gotcha. you, well, Roy. The Statue of Liberty says to give your tired, your poor, your huddled masses yearning to breathe free. Are, are we really upholding these famous words if we <laughs> curb the flow of immigration? Well, first of all, if we were to curb immigration back to two hundred fifty thousand, we would be we would be bringing people in at the rate that we have brought it in on average in our first 200 years as a nation. So it's not really like we're, we're going back to a, a, so a, a, a no immigration period. Secondly, uh, those, those words are on a plaque. It's in a poem. You know, those, mm-hmm. those words you're quoting, they're in a poem, and it's on a plaque that hangs inside the Statue of Liberty. Statue of Liberty uh, has been appropriated as a symbol for immigration, because so many immigrants saw it when they sailed in the harbor. But, this, but the name of the Statue of Liberty actually is Liberty Enlightening the World, and it reaches out with a, a flame of liberty and holding uh, the rule of law, book of law. And what, it, what the intention of the Statue of Liberty was, was not that poem, but in all the speeches when it was dedicated was that America would be an example to the rest of the world of what a country with liberty and rule of law could do for everybody. And one of the problems about the rule of law <laughs> is that you, you, if you have rules to protect your most vulnerable members of your society and then you break them, that's not a model for the rest of the world. Uh, we we I, should I have a country in which the law protects our, our, our uh, most vulnerable workers. I think we got it. But let's look at, it, at the uh, percentages. 24% of the legal aliens are in California, 16% reside in Texas, 40% of your problem is in two states. Are we really saying that the problem financially is going to impact the beleaguered California economy and may kind of bring down Texas if we buy your scenario yeah. completely? 
Well, that's a that's a, that's a Wait, what say you? That's a great point. No, it's a great point. California has one of the worst unemployment rates in the country, and uh, it's. I mean, you have, we all have seen you know one economic crisis after another with their, or I should say, financial crisis with their state government. I think uh, California is. Uh, I mean, we may have to see it go into receivership if this bill goes through. Texas is a situation in which wow, it's actually doing pretty well economically, but yeah, if if it wants to see where it's going to go. If, uh, if when this if this bill passes, it just has to look at California. Uh, it's for one thing when immigration, and this is true. This has nothing to do with ethnicity. It has to do with every immigrant wave. Every time we've had a big immigrant wave in our last 150 years, those waves vote overwhelmingly Democratic uh, because of a number of reasons. But one of them is just they have lower incomes than the average American, and they vote for the party that that gives out more. Uh, benefits. So what we'll see in Texas, if this bill passes, is a very rapid switch from Texas, from a primarily a Republican political system to a Democratic political system like California. Um, and it will be dealing with these incredible amounts of extra poverty. The business climate will greatly change. Uh, it would be one of the worst things could possibly happen to the businesses of California, but it also would be uh, just uh, an incredibly bad situation for uh, people who, for the for the wage earners of Texas, who will now, see now, their wages uh, decline. Now, Roy, you've been very articulate. You're making your point clear, uh, clearly, and we're trying to hear you out. But I, I have one problem with the last statement you made about the um, basically Democratic Party taking the lion's share of the people. Um, isn't it the responsibility of conservatives, I consider myself a conservative, uh, to sell uh, the people coming to citizenship on the advantage of our policies? And if we're helping people, can't we dissuade them from doing things that are counterproductive? So it sounds like um, we're assuming that the um, uh, conservative movement is not going to respond to the needs of the people and immigration is a major problem, I would say, for California. But aren't there a lot of other fiscal issues, uh, not to mention our the governor uh, having, you know, spent, <laughs> spent the whole uh, state into oblivion uh, basis for these problems? we got about uh, a minute for you to you, respond no, to you're, that. You're exactly right. There are many causes of all of these things. The big thing is those for us is that immigration does make it worse. Uh, yes, immigrants should be, should be sought after by all political parties. But historically, uh, immigrants move or only be move towards the Republican Party in any kind of large numbers as they assimilate into the middle class. Large immigration slows down people's entrance into the middle class. If the Republican Party wants to really reach out to Hispanics, for example, in this country, they should tighten the labor market, slow down immigration, help Hispanics move out of their terrible poverty, and move into the middle class. Frankly, it's the same thing they ought to be doing for black Americans. I mean, there's no reason why the Republican Party should not be working just as hard to to, uh, attract black Americans uh, into their party. But immigration is one of those things that's helping keep poverty so high among black Americans. I really appreciate your having me on today. Uh, good, good, good visit. We well, have a couple it has more been minutes. Back the, uh, we, no, we are about at the final 30 seconds. Okay. How can they reach you, uh, Roy? NumbersUSA.com. NumbersUSA.com. And you will find everything is free. You will find a way to sign up. We will let you know what your members of Congress need to hear about this big immigration fight and provide you free ways to communicate with Congress uh, to let them know how you feel about it. Well, we thank you so much for being with us. Folks, you've been listening to the voice of Roy Back, president and CEO of Numbers USA. I think he's given us a strong philosophical conceptual argument about why the immigration reform approach that we've been given so far may not work. After the break, we'll come back, talk a little bit more about how we think we should break up this process of transforming how America does 
immigration and listen to Harry Jackson and the Harry Jackson Show. Stay tuned. There's no greater feeling of patriotism and appreciation for the men and women who gave their lives for our freedom than to stand at the Tomb of the Unknown Soldier at the Arlington National Cemetery in Washington, D.C. Hello, everyone. I'm Tim Wildman, president of the American Family Association and American Family Radio. That will be just one of the many stops we'll have in Washington, D.C., our nation's capital, as we explore our spiritual heritage our Christian history. For all the information on these tours in June and September with Stephen McDowell of the Providence Foundation joining us, please go to the website spiritualheritagetours.com, spiritualheritagetours.com, or call us at 800-FAMILIES, 800-F-A-M-I-L-I-E-S for a free brochure and join us on one of our spiritual heritage tours in June and September. This is Life Issues with Brad Mattis, Executive Director of Life Issues Institute. The Obama administration says sequestration means they can't give school children tours of the White House, but somehow they found $350 million for what they call comprehensive sex education programs that begin in kindergarten. Your tax dollars are given to something called Personal Responsibility Education Program, but personal responsibility are the last words I'd use to describe it. They teach children there are no don'ts with sexual activity, except, of course, being pregnant. But not to worry, they have abortion for this inconvenience. Planned Parenthood is participating and is actually paying money to children to get them to participate, with your tax dollars, of course. And since the kids can't go to the White House, they have more time on their hands. Life Issues. Stay informed. More informed than you've ever been. With today's Faith to Action commentary, here's Janet Porter. Our gun rights are up for a vote. A vote on gun control could take place very soon in the U.S. Senate after a filibuster fell short last week. If Senate Majority Leader Harry Reid gets his way, there would be a universal gun registry, a ban on certain kinds of shotguns, handguns, and rifles, and individuals could be sent to prison for 15 years for negligently selling, gifting, or raffling a firearm. Expanded watch lists would make it more difficult for millions of Americans to own guns. Please call your two U.S. Senators at 202-224-3121 and urge them to strongly oppose Senator Reid's proposals and preserve our Second Amendment freedoms. That's 202-224-3121. Visit F2A.org for more commentaries and action steps, along with news, links, and much more for your state. Go to F2A.org. Welcome back to The Harry Jackson Show. I'm your host, Harry Jackson. Our last guest, uh, Roy Beck, is an interesting man. I think he had a lot of good points. He's actually a war uh, hero, and uh, he was a recipient of the U.S. uh, commendation, um, Army commendation in 1972. And uh, again, I think he's a good guy. He focused on numbers. One of the challenges that we have, though, in dealing with uh, undocumented aliens, I have been struggling with this whole thing. How do you say it? Illegal immigrants is what we conservative folks mostly say, traditionalists. And uh, you'll notice that all the guys on the far left say undocumented uh, people. And one does kind of slap you in the face kind of strong, Uh, you're illegal, undocumented, Uh, sounds like your paperwork is coming, although in some cases you're undocumented because you lie and you stole some things. Uh, So somewhere in between is probably the right right way to address this. But, But I do think that there is a problem in America, and we're reading uh, in the D.C. area, we have a newspaper called the Afro and a big article was in that um, paper basically saying it's bad for African Americans that we have a liberal immigration policy. It will cause competition at the bottom for these 
low-end jobs. If you look at the information in USA Today and Washington Post and others, the group that is most highly in favor of opening up the immigration reform avenues nationwide actually are African Americans. And I think it may be that African Americans have, on this one, uh, have come to a wise understanding. There's so many ways that our faith and our uh, social engagement are kind of askew, uh, Pastor Dave, that we, 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 we get this confused. But on this one, we may have it right. And that is there's going to have to be an increase of skilled job uh, prepare, preparation. I'll get the word out. If you're going to see major increase for African-Americans long term in this economy, scraping for fighting for the lowest of the low jobs as though it's the only resource is not a wise way to prepare for the future. And so I think that there's going to have to be a reasoned approach to how we deal with immigration reform. We're prepared to look at a couple of these things uh, in just a second. And, um, but I do think that it is pivotal that we look at what this gentleman, Roy Beck, said. I think the most compelling thing that he said is this. If we haven't taken into account the huge numeric swing that this change in the employment base will have on the bottom line of troubled states in terms of entitlement programs, uh, public services that are being used in the state of California, 24%, one out of every four of these folks who are considered undocumented or illegal, if the number is 18 to 20 million, which is why I asked him that question in the beginning, which I personally happen to believe it is closer to the 20 million number or higher. If that number is right, and these guys are teetering on the verge of economic collapse, they better think it through about how they process people, not whether people are valuable or their family is valuable or any of these kinds of things. Uh, we need to get the right terminology, all that correctly. We need to be more sensitive as traditional uh, values folk. But we need to count the cost and say, can our public systems in California handle it or not? What do you think about that aspect? A little nuanced, but am I making sense? I, I think you're making a lot of sense, and it certainly doesn't sound like California's in a position to handle this uh, with an overwhelming majority of the illegal immigrants heading towards either California or Texas, uh, they do have some some problems to, to politically handle. They, they really do. So we're once again launching into something, no offense, but I got to say it this way, launching into something like Obamacare. Well, I'm going to read the bill after I agree to pass it. We want comprehensive. You'll understand I don't like that word. Why? Because it's sort of like I'm going to put this great big blanket over all these things. Well, what's under comprehensive? Well, I don't know, but well, we, it's the right thing to do, comprehensive. Well, why don't we pull back the blanket of comprehensive and let's talk about some of the things that are going to be in this bill. And I think it would help us out quite a bit. In other words, some are talking about, uh, uh, Rand Paul is talking about enforcing security at the borders, but also what are we going to do about facilitating assimilation into uh, the culture? Folks have to get the language down, all those things, and we need to assure that they're being processed in the United States. Mm -hmm. If this was Israel, and I had the privilege of being in Israel last year, I was so incredibly blessed to be in Israel and to go to a place where Ethiopian immigrants were actually being housed. Their kids were given specialized uh, schooling to master the language at the expense of the government. 
And there was an orderly process where they were being helped to find their way into the society. There's a transition process that did not seem to be demeaning or in, it wasn't to make them dependent long term. It was simply to give them the best possible launch into that culture. And I'm not so sure I'm hearing anything like that yet. And um, there also is a huge problem here about how we deal with the children of the immigrants. Once again, this year we had a whole lot of kids who were born in America and who are saying, wow, we should be given all rights and privileges. I understand that, and I think that's fair at a certain level. But on another level, we got to prevent folks from just showing up here, and uh, you might be a former member of the Taliban, or you're part of the MS-13 gang terrorizing folk, and just because you have the capacity to have a child, your child is a citizen of of the nation? I mean, that makes no logical sense to me whatsoever. Oh, so now your baby was born in America? They're here, and now we got to do all these different things. So we've got to screen. A couple of administrative things that are really key are it should not take seven years. We've talked about uh, one of our mutual friends uh, who's originally from Columbia, mm-hmm. met his wife at our church, mm-hmm. got married at a church, mm-hmm. and then we found out later that he was undocumented. Yes. What? <laughs> Yeah, and of course he's turned out to be a tremendous man, a man of God. Uh, now he's he's done. He did all his homework. He paid all his uh, bills. He had his own business. He's got great kids. Uh, wonderful church man, and really helping the community and helping uh, his uh, uh, the organization and helping his people in his in his community. So we we thank God he did it the right way. But it took him a long time because the process was more like a seven year process. He had to invest $4,000. I personally walk with him and counsel with him on about four or five occasions. So I think he spent at least twenty-five dollars to $30,000 to get through a process that if he hadn't been gypped and cheated and manipulated by American citizens should have cost him $2,500 to $30,000. He pays nearly $30,000. And uh, we've seen members uh, deported. Mm-hmm. You remember one of our children's church workers yes, we have. who was uh, a trained lawyer from an uh, African country, uh, was here, wonderful Christian uh, woman with great spirit, and um, her green card arrived days after she was deported. Once they deport you, you can't get back in for 10 years. And all because uh, this INS organization did not have, in my opinion, appropriate systems or boundaries in place. So these things, we can shorten this process to 18 months, shorten the paperwork, doesn't take that long to tell people yay or nay, and uh, decide what we're going to do with them. Uh, If you're going to let them in, let them in. If you're not, let them know. And uh, I've noticed there's a lengthy thing in a book we wrote with Um, Tony Perkins' personal faith public policy that the quotas for immigration from certain regions have been moved up and down, back and forth over the years based on our feelings toward the nation uh, that people are coming from. And um, there's a lot of adjustment uh, that we could make to the process to streamline it so that people would not be forced uh, to feel like, well, my kids are here, we've been here so long, now they turn me down, three and a half, four years into the process, I'm not going home now, Uh, I'll take my chances, maybe my paperwork will come through in a month, or X, Y, and Z. And that's at least how a lot of the people who have been immigrants from various African nations, et cetera, got wound up moving into an illegal status, some being deported. Um, Again, 
administration can be severely changed and challenged, and then Border Patrol has got to be something that we deal with. And then we, I think we've got to penalize the employers who allow people, undocumented people to work in these areas. I mean, they sh- they really should enforce those particular laws on the employers uh, who are hiring illegal immigrants, not and not obeying the law in that particular area. Well, I mean, it, it, it's like you use a terrible uh, analogy of fishing. Um, if there is no bait on the hook, people are not going to jump up, or the fish are not going to jump up onto. Uh, an unbaited hook and say, take me to your boat. Uh, And so nobody's coming into the country with all of its problems and difficulties if there's an incentive. The incentive for the undocumented worker is you're going to get a job anyway if you just get in. And so if you take away that incentive where folks cannot be employed, the worst in the world and documented in the last four or five years, has been various uh, aspects of the meatpacking industries, be it the Midwest or the South. And we found that they have repeatedly uh, brought in undocumented workers. Uh, there's a town in, uh, Flo- in uh, Georgia that it was, it used to have all blacks working, then it moved them out because they were having accidents. The African-Americans were uh, signing insurance claims. Then they brought all Hispanics in for a while. The Swift Food Company has several documented claims against itself uh, for uh, accidents on the job because of icy floors, slippery surfaces, and uh, all kind of people were injured. Some deaths actually occurred in other meatpacking industry plants. And so... Is we've got a problem that people are being taken advantage of because the employer feels, to Roy Beck's point, that, oh, yeah, well, we can just use these people, but it's an enforcement problem on the company, not just a ban that needs to be made on the individual. If all these pieces aren't working together, I, I don't think we have reform but we have major problems. We've got about a minute uh, left in the program today. I want to remind everybody that AFR share starts Tuesday, tomorrow, and um, we want to support this uh, American Family Radio. What an incredible network. We are here on the air uh, due to the vision of this organization. Also, Tuesday night, same night, Uh, I am going to be on TBN, Trinity Broadcasting Network, uh, on there with Clifton Davis, and uh, we get to share some thoughts. I think that will be a blessing to you. Uh, There are more overt biblical teaching, and then the Christian Men's Network, I'm keynote speaker for that group in the great city of Dallas at their international men's conference on Thursday night. So it's a busy, busy week for us. You can reach out, find our schedule, and check in on us at theharryjacksonshow.com. And we'd love to hear from you. Uh, David Perlett, thank you for being in the studio with us. We want to talk our next immigration uh, program about your family. you got a lot to add in that regard. Talk to you again tomorrow.